Hello everyone. My name's Amy, Bright Blessings. Um, I'm a member of Companions of the Journey, which is a spiritual community that Sean is currently the spiritual director of. I discovered Sean through his YouTube channel, Spirits um, in Space Suits, and he really changed the way I saw Christianity. I come from a pagan path, a druidic path, and, and, and I felt kind of a little bit weird about Christianity. I felt a bit confronted about the patriarchy and about judgments that I held about Christianity. Um, and I just feel that Sean really changed that. He opened my mind and saw that the message of Jesus was love and compassion and that there's so much there. The stories there are so rich and so valuable outside of just the institutions and the infrastructure of Christianity that so many people are familiar with. Um, I consider myself a Celtic Christian and a Druid. Um, my Druid path goes all the way back to 2007 when I first discovered Obod, the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, and I began um, the Bardic course in 2016. Philip Cargom is uh, the, the past chief of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, um, and Druidry for me um, is a beautiful earth-based spirituality that connects us with Mother Nature, it connects us with the elements, and um, I feel that there's a real there's a real calling to blend Druidry and Christianity. I feel like when you bring them together, you get this, this beautiful space of compassion for nature, for the elements, for all the beings. Um, and in Christianity, a real compassion for other humans and, and a connection with, with the vastness of, of God herself. Um, so I'd like to welcome you both, um, Philip and Sean. It's so wonderful to have such respected wisdom keepers as yourselves sharing space. And I want to express my deep gratitude um, to you both for taking time out of your busy schedules to come together in a spirit of friendship, curiosity and healing and open up this conversation between Druidry and Christianity. I also want to take a moment to give thanks for this day, for this moment, and to ask for the blessings of the ancestors of these rich spiritual traditions, for the blessings and grace of God herself, Jesus Christ and all the saints and the angels, for the blessings of the gods and the goddesses, for the blessings of the land, the sea and the sky and all the beings who dwell therein. May they guide us towards deeper understanding and unity in our search for the divine within us and without. To begin our discussion, I would like to ask you both to share a few words about yourselves and your spiritual paths, um, what divinity, spirit, God, goddess looks like for you, um, and how you honour this in your day to day. Philip, perhaps as you're the guest on the Spirits and Spacesuits channel, perhaps you would like to begin. Well, gosh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And, and maybe to start with, just uh, if viewers, understand that you're in Tasmania, Sean is is in California, and I'm on the south coast of England. Uh, and, and that seems kind of significant. It's very magical and wonderful that we can do this. And, and it sort of somehow reflects the kind of work or aim uh, that you that you set out so clearly with that beautiful intention and, and prayer at the beginning. And um, you asked a question that had about four components in it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> tell me just just run them past me again yeah, thing. so i want to know um what does spirit or god what what is the overarching power in the universe for you that that it affects your life um and how do you honor that in your day-to-day -day? okay yes lovely um well um my experience of of spirit um when was uh I suppose you could say it began intellectually at the age of 11. When I was 11, I read a book called The Life of the Buddha, which opened me to this idea of the quest for experiencing the divine, if you like. And in that same year, I met the old chief druid, who was a friend of my dad's. So, so this sort of Buddhism and, and, and druidry were introduced to me at the same time. And I started trying to meditate because I wanted to experience spirit, enlightenment, the divine. Um, and um, 
I I started, you know, then five years passed, as it were, and I met the, uh, I, I started training with the old Druid chief, Ross Nichols. And um, my experience of the divine has never been, well, I was, do you know what I was going to say, actually? I was going to say it's never been personal. It's been a sense when I've had what I would term mystical experiences of 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 uh, oneness and union. I've I've been blessed with some wonderful experiences of kind of transcending time and space and being filled with a sense of bliss and uh, eternity and infinity. And they haven't had a spiritual uh, a personal dimension to them, except in 1988, which was at the time of harmonic convergence. I think it was 88. Uh, which was this big kind of, it was the first kind of event where people were talking about some sort of uh, major sort of initiation at a sort of global level and people were tuning in all over the world. And I went, I was in France at the time and I went up uh, up this hillside in a very lovely part of France and I had a meditation. And at some point, and it felt very good, nothing special, but, but, deeply peaceful and wonderful, you know, and good. As I started to walk down the hillside, I had a strong sense of a, of a presence, of a being who said, come back to me. And I was 30 yards, 30 yards down the mountain. So I said, well, I don't need to physically come back to you because we're all one. And the, the, the cosmic reality is one force. I don't, you know, I don't need to re walk back up. To... And so I started walking away from this being. And as I walked away, I started to cry. Mm -hmm. And and I knew that I had so at some point, there was this sort of point of, I suppose, sort of humility of, 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 of crying and of turning around and of doing something that was irrational uh, in a, in, from a sort of scientific reductionist sense. I turned around and I walked back to the physical location where I'd been. And I sat down and was just open to, you know, what, what, what's going on? And this being taught me something, which sounds very simple when I relay it, but it was so profound. Uh, and when I say it, it's just this. It said, yes, you're right. We are all one, you know, deity is uh, evenly distributed throughout the universe. There's nothing but but God, goddess. Mm. And yet, mm -hmm. there is also such a thing as uh, a, a, an individual entity and spiritual being. I mean, it was it was, and and more tears flowed. It was the most beautiful experience of of of, of realizing this sort of paradoxical truth, or in, ha having this paradoxical insight. And so I would say it was at that moment that the idea of a personal deity uh, I experienced in, 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 within myself, whereas before all my, my experiences had been impersonal. I'm, you know, um, so I don't know if it's, anyway, that's, that's what I feel moved to share. That's beautiful, Philip. And so after that experience, did you feel, um, do you feel drawn to return to that place or in your, in each day, do you take a moment to reconnect with, with the sense of that being or is there any, I know we live such busy lives, don't we? It's so difficult yeah. sometimes to make space for these magical, magical moments. Hmm. Well, funny, funny enough, that particular event triggered a, a, a huge change in my life. I mean, I, I basically uh, got divorced. I decided that 17 years of marriage in an extremely difficult marriage was enough and I needed to leave. So, I mean, my life, my life changed radically and dramatically and, and was very difficult, but also liberating. And it's only occurred to me now by by you asking this question, which is why I love conversation and dialogue. And, and thank you so much for this. The next time this really happened to me is we have a little house in the garden here. 
uh, where various very interesting people have lived and stayed. And I um, went for a walk one day from our house, our main house, down the lane. And as I walked down the lane, this was probably about 10 years ago. No, no, probably about seven years ago. I felt as if an angel was to my left. There was this beautiful sense of this being. And, and I, I walked down the lane and I just appreciated the feeling. And, and that was it, as it were. It, was, it, it lasted for a few minutes and then I'd lost, I, I went for my walk. As I walked back, I thought, why don't I try to establish a relationship with this being? and I went in and I knew what I had to do I went straight into this little house in the garden with a notebook and a and a pen and I sat down and closed my eyes to make and asked if I could be in contact with this being again I opened my eyes and opposite me was a postcard that my daughter had bought from Keats's where Keats had died in Italy in Rome of an angel climbing through a window to see somebody wow <laughs> and i then i then asked i decided to ask the angel the big questions like you know what's going on and who who are you and why are we here <laughs> and what's it all about and all i said and 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 uh and and i and so i made a, a, a little book out of it um of these conversations it was the easiest book in the world to write because i didn't write it this lovely being wrote it um and it sounds strangely silly of me to then tell you that i don't regularly have these kinds of you would think you'd be listening to me and you'd be thinking well this chap's had two kind of rather interesting experiences of you know why doesn't he why doesn't he do this more often? You know, why has he only done it twice in his life? But that's, I should do it more, but I, I, I haven't really done that much. I should do it more, but I've found these experiences so profound and so nourishing. It's almost like they've been sufficient unto themselves do you see what i mean rather than saying oh well, why don't i have a conversation with an angel every morning and just sit down and tune in and so on um so so i i absolutely understand i i feel i understand the whole question of the personal god idea in christianity that i used to find a little alien and and it just didn't speak to me prior to to that first experience it's just I, you know, it didn't sort of work for me, but, but it does work for me now. I, I, I get it. And I've actually had some of the most profound experiences in a Christian church in Brittany. I, I, I uh, came into touch with a, a Orthodox Celtic church in Brittany, but um, mm. anyway. Yes. Yeah. I think you, you speak of that church in your Sikh teachings everywhere book. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I would love to visit there one day. Um, mm. That's a perfect point, Sean, to, to ask you the personal God. Um, and and right. Sean, I know that you, um, in your um, spiritual worldview, you have a sense that God exists in fractals. So it's, yes. it's, it's sort of like, I guess, Philip had said he didn't believe in a personal God right. um, originally, and it was sort of like a like an, an an external god i guess and then all of a sudden there was this moment of of personal contact and that's almost like a like a fractal coming in that's a sort of the existing on multiple levels sean mm -hmm. could you speak to to what your what divinity and and spirit and god looked like to you and and how you would honor that in your day to day sure and i love what philip has just shared with us and so as i said uh, i literally live in the middle of the forest you know, I'm surrounded by, you know, redwood trees and madronas and manzanitas and there are two little creeks flowing through there. And so I, I don't have that much human contact on a regular basis. Um, so, and when I'm, when my dog was still alive, we trekked a my, for miles and miles and miles every day. And uh, I realized that I had a personal relationship with the forest and with the creeks, you know, but the forest is not a person, but I'm a person and therefore the only kind of relationship I can have with anything is a personal relationship. 
And so I began to feel like, even if God is not personal in the way in which we typically understand person, I'm a person, and the only way I can experience that is having some kind of personal connection. And then I realized that when you trawl, for instance, within the Christian system of the notion of Trinity, and it's fascinating to me looking at your work, Philip, and looking at many, many different areas, how frequently the word Trinity appears, like Owen, the, the very Owen itself is like uh, three shafts of light. And then Patrick mm. well and he used the shamrock. And we have mm. in Hinduism, we have uh, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. You know, uh, in Buddhism, we have Saranam Gachami, uh, Haranam Gachami. You know, I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the teaching. I take refuge in the community. So we get this Trinitarian formula repeated again and again. And the Christian version of it somehow was that they talked about being having three persons in the one God. But when you actually examine the literature, the Greeks were the people who articulated this and they used the Greek word prosopon, that there are three prosopon in the one uh, God. But prosopon actually means a mask. And it was the mask that a Greek actor would wear on stage to clue the audience in as to what kind of a character he's going to portray. So if I came out with a mask that looked like this is going to be a comedy. If I come up with a mask that looked like that, it was going to be a tragedy. And so the prosopon was the mask that clued the audience in as to what kind of a character to expect. Now, when that got translated into Latin by the Latin church, they used the word persona. And persona literally means, you know, to speak through. There was a, a mask with a hole in it. You could speak through it and two holes for the eyes. So it was the device through which you spoke. So persona literally was the mask you wore through which you kind of made contact or communicated. But that then led to the word, you know, persona, and then personality, and then person. And then we see them as kind of distinct, kind of dis distinct, ontologically discrete entities. And mm -hmm. that was not the original intention. It was, you know, there are three ways in which you're going to experience the ineffable. You know, one is as creator aspect, the other is a sustaining, and the other is the one that kind of dismantles and recombines. The same thing within Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And so for me, it's that the only way in which we can encounter the divine is in some personal way because we're persons. And therefore, in some senses, the ultimate isness will articulate itself or present itself in ways that look like persons or angels or whatever it needs to do in order to establish the kind of contact we have with us. And so for me, in, in a sense, then I look at many, many different levels of this phenomenon. So I call this guy in this space suit here, I call this my role self. So I'm a guy with an Irish accent wearing a green Gansey, you know, that's my role self in this incarnation. But there's a soul self which was never born and will never die. And that's my eternal essence. And that itself is a holographic fractal of what I call my source self, the isness of all that could be and that is, and what I want to call it, God or source or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so there's this fractalization process that happens. Uh, um, uh, Hebrew, the Hebrew kind of uh, Kabbalah will talk about netzvatzim, sparks of the divine, that in some senses, this total unity consciousness fractures itself into holographic portions of itself. And a fractal is simply a pattern that repeats at an infinite number of scales. And a hologram is that which contains all of itself in every one of its parts. And so mm -hmm. nothing is lost. And so there's nothing is lost at the soul level until we come down into the kind of the space suit level. And then we see everything is distinct and separate from us. And that's when we run into trouble. And the journey for me then, the journey back to God is to continually disidentify with my role self, to disidentify with my physicality, emotionality, intellectuality, personality, the job I do, the relationships I have or whatever, to disidentify sequentially with those until I give birth to God. Like Meister Eckhart would say in the 1300s, of what use to me is it? that my savior was born of a virgin 1300 years ago. He's not born again in my time. And in my heart, every single one of us is meant to be the mother of God. And I believe that that actually is the, is the function of all spirituality. It is to help people to create altered states of consciousness in which they can individually give birth to God in some kind of an incarnated fashion in their relationships. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that that's fantastic, Sean, isn't it? And when you say give birth to God, do you mean manifesting, as it were, being able to drop the personality sufficiently for God to shine through, as it were? So, Absolutely. so, yeah. Absolutely. So there's yeah. there's this great statement in in Luke's Gospel in the New Testament 
for Christ allegedly says, uh, you must be compassionate as your heavenly father is compassionate. Now, the New Testament is written in Greek, but Jesus was speaking Aramaic. And the word that he's using, uh, the word for um, compassion in Aramaic is rachmim, which is the plural for the word for a womb. And mm-hmm. the word which is translated as father, you know, in the New Testament, in the Aramaic is awun, which means the birthing principle of the cosmos. So here's what mm-hmm. I cr- hear Christ saying. You must uh, be womb-like as the birthing principle of the cosmos itself is womb like so we have to keep giving birth the womb is that which can conceive carry and give birth sequentially and so initially we give birth to an ego at about eight months we become aware of me as distinct from mother you know and then there's the selfish period at a later stage we kind of give birth to a sense of our materiality i am you know, kind of the uh, the edges of my uh, ego kind of uh, space with my going e- space out. then i start giving kind of identifying with my emotions at some stage, I'm identified with my intellect. At some stage, I'm identified with my profession. At some stage, I'm inter- identified with my relationships. Mm-hmm. And each of these are kind of sequential birthings. Uh, and what Eckhart is telling us, and what I believe that real mystics are telling us is, keep going, keep giving birth, keep disidentifying with that with which you previously identified. That's just a step in the journey. Take the next step. What is the next version of you going to look like? And finally, you wind up with a realization of the soul self, that I'm a holographic fractal of source. And that's the antechamber. That's the kind of the penultimate stage before there is total kind of reabsorption mm-hmm. back into the one, uh, one unity consciousness. So by mm-hmm. birthing, I mean the conscious spiritual um, progress and determination to keep birthing greater and greater versions of the self. Mm. I love that, Sean. Mm-hmm. And I guess- your this particular worldview that you have, Sean. This isn't a traditional Christian worldview, is it? It's not what what we would learn about in church. Could you speak to how your your path is different to to we, what we might consider a, a traditional Christian path? Just so we can get a sense of, um, and Philip, I'll also ask you about your path, but so we can get a sense of how how you're both similar to these two um, traditions, Druidry and Christianity. Christianity that we're comparing and how you're different. So, Sean? I was really lucky to have been raised by my great-grandmother and my grandparents. I was the first child of a first child of a first child. And so I was um, I was 10 years old before my, my great-grandmother died yeah, and 10 years old before one of my grandfathers died. And my great-grandmother was a Christian mystic. For her, uh, Mother Mary was more real than you guys are to me right now. Mm-hmm. I would hear her on a daily basis having conversations with Mary. Now, unfortunately, I was only privy to one end of the conversation. But obviously, my great-grandmother, I couldn't pronounce her name. I called her Muddy. So Muddy would have these out loud conversations with Mother Mary, and I would be listening into them. And then at age six, I, w- I was given back to my grandparents at the other side. And I had a grandfather whom I called Daddy Jim, whom I regard as he was at least a bard, possibly a druid. He was a great Irish step dancer. He was a consummate musician, and he was the best storyteller I've ever come across in my life. And he filled me up with all the great Christian and uh, the great um, pre-Christian Celtic mythology. Mm. So I was raised bilingually in Gaelic and uh, and English. So I was filled up with all these great mythologies of the uh, the the um, the Cúchulainn and Fionn Macall and Niamh Cian Oir, you know, mm. Danann. I was brought up with that. And then I got to the seminary, spent eight years in the seminary, and then got to Africa. And now I encountered the mythologies of Africa. And I always remember when I was still in high school, there was um. Uh, I would visit regularly villages in Ireland where Gaelic was still the spoken language. So there's one village called Khole. I spent an entire summer and I was collecting proverbs. And in Gaelic, we call them Shanochil, which literally means ancient words. And I'd visit each household and ask the elders, give me a proverb and explain to me into what context you'd use it. And I always remember one old man saying to me, he said, if Christianity had never come to Ireland, we could live according to the proverbs. He was absolutely right. There was no situation which, you know, pre-Christian Celtic spirituality couldn't cover or didn't have a spiritual answer to, you know, drawing on their own kind of wisdom. And so when I went to Africa and I got the opportunity of learning a few African languages and a few different African mythologies, that was the conclusion I came to. It was like that was the third that was the the third prong of the stool. And my great grandmother who was a Christian mystic, my grandfather was a druid, and now I'm living in Africa with the mythologies of Africa. And one of the first things I said was, you know, 
if Christian mysteries, uh, missionaries had never come to Africa, you guys could live according to your Proverbs. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the mixture for me so that I could abstract away from kind of the form or the organization or the dogma and find the underlying kind of stories because for me, stories are the archived wisdom of a culture. Mm -hmm. You want to know the wisdom of any culture, go to their stories not to their intellectual treatises or their philosophies or their scientific models, but to their parables and their stories. And so that's what I kind of, that's what I soaked myself in. And okay. so that was the beginning of kind of a disillusionment with organizational religion and the Roman Catholic Church particularly, and got into trouble on a regular basis for, for my viewpoints and my, my preaching until finally you know, on the Feast of St. Francis in 2010, I got a two-page letter from the Vatican telling me they no, no longer required my services. Yes, I just I just love the diversity and how I love how you are. You're sort of um, you're surrounded and you're so open to so many different ideas. So you have like this beautifully, really well-rounded view of of the world. I think and and I think um, we always have to be seeking, don't we? We always have to be wanting to learn more and, and learn new stuff because if we just sit in the in the one space we'll stagnate and if you if you don't push the walls then then you're never going to grow um philip could you tell me yeah. about how your path um is different to i guess to try and define it a traditional druid's path <laughs> is difficult <laughs> because it is such a per it is such a personal spirituality and it looks different for everyone um but mm. but you wrote the coursework for um, the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. You must have had a sense of of, of what it was to, to be a Druid and what, what one would need to know to be a Druid. So considering that that, that is perhaps a, a traditional way of being a Druid, how, how, it, how are you similar to and how do you differ to, to that Druid path as offered by Obod? Sure. Well, well I think... Um when what sean was saying it reminded me of, of something um that I've, I've put on my sort of website actually which is that although druidry is my sort of the the the, the term i use to describe the path uh that that the, that i follow it really i believe that we've come to an era where we can go beyond labels so i sort of see myself as a sort of universal mystic and so when Sean was describing these sort of tributaries that sort of feed, have fed him of the, the stories in Africa and his uh, grandfather and, and great-grandmother, wasn't it? Um, you know, uh, all these different strands. For, for me, that's the same thing. So I, I tend to, I think that disidentification process that Sean was talking about in, in reference to one's experience of the divine or of uh, yeah, of the divine, um, which incidentally is used in psychosynthesis, which is a particular kind of yes. spiritual psychology I've trained yes. in. They have a lovely disidentification yes. exercise, very sort of similar idea. Um, I think in a, in a, in a way, um, I, 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 I find it important to do the same thing in relation to my spiritual uh, connections, you know, so I will identify with Druidry and then I'll disidentify with it deliberately, as it were, and, and go to a different place and so on. And um, I've always been interested in, in different paths. And so, so when, um, for the last probably about 15 years now, I've been studying Jainism uh, wow. and sort of incorporated Jain ideas into my own personal practice. And one of the insights that I had around that, it used to be sort of Buddhism and, 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 and Druidry and then, you know, um, and then Wicca and Druidry and, and uh, then it became Jainism and Druidry. And one of the insights I had was it um, a bit like binocular vision, that if I, I, I've got a friend, for instance, a chap um, got to know me, uh, and we started having breakfast regularly, a very nice, you know, once a fortnight, we'd have breakfast in town and share ideas. And, and he was so similar to me, a very similar background, training as a psychologist, working as a psychotherapist, interested in all this stuff, doing it. And yet so different. So part of what we were doing when we were having breakfast together is we were sharing all our similarities and then kind of noticing the slight differences. And what happens is, I think if you study two spiritualities, you you get two perspectives. And so the sort of reality, if you like, becomes 3D as opposed to 2D. It's like it gives you binocular vision instead of monocular vision. But a thing that helped me 
greatly on the way was was I was always kind of haunted by this idea that you should really only follow one spiritual path. Mm-hmm. You know, it started with my 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 druid teacher who gave me that idea, although he was Christian and druid, funnily enough, himself. Um, and but it was an it's an idea that's been around a long time. You know, which is you know you don't mix your drinks. Um, you know, there's only one path up the many paths up the mountain, but just take the one path, choose a path and take it. Don't, you know, so so I felt that I was being a bit of a dilettante by exploring other paths, you know, and a little voice inside me used to say, why don't you just stick to the one thing? Why do you keep be- becoming interested in other paths? And I then at one of the Druid camps, one of the Obod camps we had, I met a member who was a Buddhist. I knew he was a Buddhist and a druid so i said to him why just out of interest why are you doing these two things like if you're a buddhist aren't you just seeking enlightenment why are you getting into druidry as well you know and and i gave him as an analogy i said surely if you're you know digging for water drilling for water you you drill in one place you don't drill in t- two places or more and he he started laughing and he said well i i happen my job is i'm a hydrologist <laughs> and your analogy <laughs> is just wrong if you want to drill for water you drill in several places you know otherwise it doesn't work you know uh and i just love that you know and he said that's that's what you know um so so i think i that's why i ended up with that seek teachings book everywhere writing that book actually uh because i think it can be really helpful to give yourself permission to explore different paths not to feel like you're betraying one path by looking at another part you know um and that that'll deepen your experience um yeah yeah that's beautiful can i pick up on your hydrology metaphor yeah yeah philip because yeah uh, i I had precisely that issue um i had to drill a well where i live i'm totally off the grid i got my own solar panels i got my own septic system my own well i had to go on 260 feet to get water um, and the water comes from pristine snow melt in the Sierra Mountains, about 50, 60 miles away from me. The problem mm. is that it's filtering through geological strata, which contain all kinds of toxins. And so by the time I get to drink it, I have to do a mm. three-party kind of cleansing system. And so mm. if I really want to know what the pristine water was like, you, like your friend, I'd have to dig all over Sonoma County and compare the kind of the specimens I got because my mm. area is unique for its geological kind of stratification. And so mm. I don't know what the original water tastes like. And that for me became an, kind of a metaphor, but the difference between religion and spirituality. Mm-hmm. Uh, spirituality mm. is the pristine water table from which all wells draw their water. But religions are the uh, the result of the stratification as they come up through, they, they take on a whole bunch of toxicities. And that's what they feed us. We're drinking water, which has been kind of uh, poisoned by organizations of various kinds. And so unless I even prepare to dig many wells, I won't find what the actual taste of the real water is. That's that's lovely. Thank you. Because because the patholo- the pathology of religion is extraordinary, isn't it? Um, you know, at one level, I find it quite fascinating. It's a bit like, you know, when you study psychology, on the one hand, you want to discover you know the the you know the sources you know what is what is the sort of optimal human being and what is mental wellness and and what is you know um and yet when it goes wrong it's fascinating too you know what, what what's happening when somebody's suffering from depression or uh ptsd or whatever you know so so uh, uh, and the same thing with re- i'm fascinated by religion and spirituality and i'm also very interested in religious pathology as well yeah. and i think a lot of i don't think that's that unusual to be interested in that i mean there are there's the you know there are a number of films you know the sort of wild wild country about the osho movement and i mean there are a lot of films about cults and where when religion goes wrong because i think when you look at something you know when it when it goes wrong it helps you to discover get a sense of what is actually right why has it gone wrong how's it gone why is it wrong why are we saying it's wrong and so on um and i remember (laughs) yes i remember i remember being in i decided to in in this sort of interest in religion i decided to go to a service in the unitarian church on nantucket you know that island one day and i went in and it was it was the day um it was it was i think hanukkah or something in the jewish tradition and so they had uh, a rabbi a female rabbi in the service in the unitarian service 
and he read as the reading from the Bible um the uh oh you know the scapegoat you know the story about the goat yes, and yes, the yes. You know, or something like that here and putting hands and, on the goat and confessing the sins of the group and sending it off into the desert by being to be eaten by by uh the demons <laughs> yeah yes that that's right and and the and the unitarian preacher he said i don't really understand this every time i read it i i i, I it's a kind of very difficult thing to understand <laughs> and the rabbi told a story there's a particular sect in judaism where once a year they take a chicken a live chicken and they say prayers and they swing the chicken by the neck over their heads until it dies and the idea is it's soaking up all the sins of the you know, and everybody's sitting there in the congregation going yikes what is this story you know? and um and then she said it's it, it's okay we don't waste it we give it to a, a poor family so oh, then I had a vision. This is terrible. This poor family with a chicken that's full of all this <laughs> negative, <laughs> completely bonkers. The whole thing, you know. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so that that's what religion can do to the source. <laughs> so shall we focus then in on on what is what is this source? What is what is God? What is the first thing? So, um, Philip, within. Hmm within a, a, dru a druidic view of the world what what would be that that purest source what what is is there a a belief in a um creator is there a sense of of what was the first thing before um the gods and the goddesses and the and the tree beings and the what what was the first thing is there is there a concept like that in druidry yes well i mean it, the first thing is it's important to state that there's there's no one druid line on this and and that uh you know the joke is that you ask 10 druids what they believe and you'll get 11 answers you know uh so so so, so um one of the rather nice things about a druid group when we're gathered all holding hands in a ceremony you might have a um you know a polytheist druid who believes that there are actually lots of gods and goddesses and there's nothing above that they are the source as it were you have duotheistic druids who believe there's a god and a goddess. You have monotheistic druids who either believe in a goddess or a god. You have atheistic druids in the sense that you sometimes people talk about Jains or Buddhists as atheistic. In other words, the sort of the concept of God they don't find helpful. That even, you know, that we can't possibly even conceive of what that might be. And therefore, a, a theistic approach is not helpful um so you can you you can um find all these beliefs um so i would hesitate you know so i can't i can't tell you what um you, you know um i i i worked out finally that i was a trans igtheist mm -hmm. and a trans igtheist <laughs> is 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 somebody who uh, admits their ignorance oh. uh, around theism, but believes in some kind of transcendent sort of reality. Um, wow. But so, so I, 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 I think the the. I mean, the, so the only answer I can give is a personal answer, as opposed to you know, on behalf of Druidry, as it were. Um, I, I, I simply don't know. I have a, I have a strong sense of a of a of a of a source of a of the, the sort of the the in, in imminent and reality of of spirit and of the divine that i believe actually everything is divine mm -hmm. i think i think you know matthew fox's idea of panentheism is probably the closest that i could come to giving it a label as such um yeah. But very cognizant yeah. of the fact that my rational, you know, you know, my mind is is unable to really articulate the reality. You go right along with you, Philip. So my when I look historically, I had this theory that when Homo sapiens sapiens developed, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens is different from Homo sapiens. So Homo sapiens developed about two hundred thousand years ago, uh, thinking beings, but they didn't have language, so they couldn't think about thinking. And then about seventy thousand years, we get Homo sapiens sapiens who have language skills. And I believe that the first uh, purpose for which we use language was storytelling. And the stories were about who are we, where do we come from, what happens when we die. And so the first kind of movement in kind of creating gods, I believe, was, uh, I call it the, the theological era. 
people are wondering about the gods and trying to explain what the gods are, and it was always plural. The second era, I think, was the era of the priests. They think they've figured out now who the gods are. Now they want to be in dialogue with them. So we get prayer and ritual of various kinds to kind of engage them. The third stage, I believe, was the era of the prophets. And these are people who purport to speak on behalf of the gods. So they're in kind of a special position. They're God's mouthpiece for the rest of us. And the fourth stage, I believe, were the mystics. And the mystics didn't talk about the gods or to the gods or on behalf of the gods. They spoke as God because they were speaking from their own inner divinity. And then the fifth group was the non-dual mystics who kept their mouths shut and never said anything. <laughs> <laughs> they realized anything you say is only metaphorical or parabolic. So <laughs> there was some kind of transcendence which is utterly ineffable. And even though we can experience it, you know, in various ways through nature or through experiences such as you've had, Philip, you know, we can't articulate it. Any effort to kind of put it into a theology is going to lose it immediately. And so when I mm. try to back out into the mystery, I come up with what I call the five L's. Ultimate source for me is just unconditional love. And love gives birth to twins. And these twins I call light and logos. And we know for, actually from physics that all matter is literally frozen light. And so uh, the, the kind of the infusion of love, you know, creates matter and logos, you know, the Greek word logos means the kind of, it is the kind of the... Uh, that which creates morphology, you know, in John's gospel, he calls it the word of God. The word is either vibration or frequency that creates form from matter, whether it's kitty cats or oak trees or human beings. And so now you have logos and light dancing together and they produce life in its various uh, aspects. And for me, the entire purpose of life is to learn how to laugh at the illusion that we've understood the mystery. <laughs> 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 Lovely. That's great. It's great. I love that. Yes. Beautiful. Um, yes. So in, in the Bible, though, you God's referred to as a he. Is it this sort of concept of God is always referred to as a he? Um, but if if we can never know, n know the essence of God or use language to describe God, wh what did the Christian mystics, what did the, what did, um, the people who wrote the Bible, what did they mean when they when they used the word he? Did they mean God the Father? And they use all these masculine pronouns, you know. What what is your take on that? Is it well, is it a man? Is saying, it a woman? Is it is it neither? The Bible, as all other great scriptural traditions, were originally oral traditions, came out of storytelling of various kinds. And the essence of storytelling is uh, uh, to put deep, deep wisdom into kind of parable form. And the mistake that we make in modern times, we think mythology is just, you know, mishugas made up by pre-scientific pre cultures who didn't really understand what the world was about. And it wasn't that. It was like they were trying to articulate in the best way possible the, the mysteries that they had experienced, the transcendent experiences they've had. And they realized that, you know, the best way to make sure it survives is either to uh, encode it in stone, a place like Gobekli Tepe, you know, in stone artifacts, or else to teach it in story form. So you have thousands and thousands of years of oral tradition before you get any written form of it. And by the time it gets to a written form, you're in the middle of a patriarchal society worldwide. And so they're now going to articulate their the, the, the uh, mythology uh, and create this kind of God figure who's very, very definitely a male figure. And when they look around them at kind of the vicissitudes of living a human life, you know, death and disease and warfare and famine and invasions and, you know, captures and whatever, this God must be a really brutal kind of a character. And you get that recorded all over. The Greek version is the same. You know, there, there's warfare in, in the heavens between, you know, the devas and the Maha, uh, in, in, in Hinduism. You get the same thing in Celtic mythology. So there's, there's, there's wars taking place. So typically it's men who go to war. And so at some stage, obviously, the top dog is a male figure. And so the scriptures are coming from a period when the stories have been reduced and are being kind of filtered through a patriarchal society. And so you're going to get very definitely um, male pronouns to describe it and get male images. You know, a guy sitting on a chair with a long white beard or whatever it is. Uh, but the mystics always realize, you know, that these are kind of corruptions of the mystery. And so that... Uh, my sense is that the mystics were the people who kind of kept the flame alive. We had a, um, there was a system in Ireland, even when I was growing up as a little child, 
that there were houses in Ireland in which the fire had not gone out for three or four hundred years. And what happened was uh, at nighttime when the family went to bed, we used turf or what in America they called peat. That was the, the firing stuff. And the mother would come and she'd gather the glowing embers together and she'd cover them with ashes to keep them insulated for the night. And she'd be the very first person up in the morning and she'd rake back the ashes and put some more turf on the glowing embers and it would burst into flames again. And so literally for hundreds of years, the fire was tended and never went out. Now, I think the mystics of all traditions and all ages were the people who kept the embers you know, hidden under the ashes of civilization, waiting to blow upon it on a regular basis and bring it back into, into flame. And that appears to me that that's the task of our times. And that's why it's so important to kind of uh, let go of kind of denominational affiliation, you know, and uh, uh, cultural identity, you know, and the, yeah, and realize that they we're basically spirits in spacesuits, you know, who volunteered to kind of bring Gaia herself into the next stage of her evolutionary process. Because I believe, like, as Hinduism teaches, that there are seven levels of the human body. There's the physical body, the etheric body, the astral body, the mental body, the psychic body, the soul body, and, and Brahma. I see the same thing for Gaia, that, you know, there's a physiosphere, which is 4.6 billion years of age. So that's kind of the physical body of Gaia. At some stage, you know, it created an atmosphere. You know, an atmosphere is the etheric body of Gaia. And it is, your, it is the womb which was necessary in order to birth life. So the second stage is atmosphere. You know, that's the womb. The third stage is the biosphere. Now she's ready to conceive. You know, and she's going to give us flora and fauna of various kinds. That's the third stage. The fourth stage is the place we're in right now. And that's the movement from the biosphere to the noosphere. Tyler de Sharda talked about the noosphere, this sheath of consciousness that surrounds the, the biosphere. And the transition from biosphere to noosphere is really, really dangerous. Because it's that stage we start developing, you know, kind of uh, weapons of mass destruction and risking ecological degradation. If we make it to the fourth place, there's a place beyond that. I call it the animosphere, the, the soul sheath. And beyond that is the pneuma sphere, the spirit shield. And then ultimately, there's the God self of Gaia. So I believe that the planet herself is ascending in this way. And that the function of awake human beings is to midwife that process individually <clears throat> and as communities. And that's what I see you doing in your community, Philip is midwifing this transition from the biosphere to the noosphere, being protective because you can't birth a noosphere from a biosphere which is dead. Mm. And so it's protecting mm. that level of Gaia in order to make it possible for the noosphere to emerge from it. Totally. That, that's, that, that's fascinating. Could I ask you something, Sean, to home in on that? You know, we've been talking about deity and these kind of commonalities what's what's particular and distinct about christianity is of course the figure of christ yes. and and jesus and i think one of you know amy you were talking about the path that you've you've taken uh where you're you're combining two the the a point of of, of resistance or a, a, a point i think that a lot of people have is that it seems necessary in order to embrace Christianity or, or in order to sort of include Christianity in their worldview or, or make a combination, is that there's the figure of Christ who seems who seems to be uh, a, a kind of gatekeeper or, you know, you have to accept him uh, as, as absolutely central to your salvation, to the, to the path. I mean, you can't be a Christian without having a relationship with Christ. And at least that's how it seems from the from right. from the outside. To do, yeah, I'd I love to hear I what you think about question. that. Yeah, I get your question completely. And I don't personally subscribe to that model. I see Jesus of Nazareth developing Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. And another word for that might be self-realization. Another word might be Krishna mind. Another might, might be Buddha nature. So there are different kinds of spiritualities will use different phraseology for it. So for me, the greatness of Jesus it was that uh, he, as an incarnated being, he managed to kind of uh, grow into Christ consciousness or Krishna mind or Buddha nature or whatever, self-realization, that he was God incarnate and that he kept saying to every single one of us, the same things I do, you will do and even greater because I go mm. and I send you the spirit. So it's not this is a one-off. 
I don't believe, for instance, in the beginning of John's gospel, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by him, and without him was made nothing that was made, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And most Christians think that only happened once with Jesus of Nazareth. I don't believe that at all. I think that okay. everything that exists is the Word of God made flesh. And that Jesus is pointing, saying, you know, it is about self-realization when you disidentify with your spacesuit and you re-identify with the fractal of the divine within you. I don't care whether you call me Jesus or Buddha, you know, or, 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 or Krishna, I don't give a damn what you call me. As long as you mm -hmm. adopt that mindset, that's mm -hmm. what I'm here to do. Yeah. But most Christians, I agree, have this fascination with, unless you believe in the Lord Jesus, you're not going to make it. This extra right. is the I don't subscribe to that at all, nor do I believe that Jesus of Nazareth taught that. Mm. Yeah. So, you, Sean, you believe Jesus is pointing us to look within and that we're all divine beings and we can all right. essentially be our own Christ. Yeah. So we all have that capacity to, to show deep compassion and love and then, I guess, sacrifice ourselves for others, essentially. Is that what you think the message is there? Yes, because to be kind of... Uh, a, you know, a, a simplistic phrase I used many years ago that everything that exists is simply God in drag. There is nothing <laughs> in the phenomenal realms which is not an articulation of the divine. It's only a question of how much self awareness as a particular life form does it have? What is the self awareness of a rock, which literally is God stuff? What's the self realization of a bunny rabbit, which is God stuff? What's yeah. the self realization of a politician, you know, which is God stuff? What's the self realization of an avatar, which is God stuff? And so, a few weeks ago, if you remember, I gave a, a metaphor from mathematics. If you look into the corner of a room where the floor meets the two side walls, you've got a three-dimensional set of axes. So the x-axis is running along the floor to your right, the y-axis is running on the floor to your left, and the z-axis is running from the floor to the ceiling. And I say that, in some senses, uh, the, the x-axis represents compassion. You know, how much of my life am I living, you know, for in service of others? And how much am I just concerned with myself? That would be the x-axis. The y-axis is how much freedom do I have in my life? Because there's a huge difference between free will and freedom. Free will is the ability to do as I please. Freedom is the ability, ability to do as pleases God. So how far along that axis am I operating? And the third, the vertical axis is self-awareness. Am I identified with my space source, with my ego, with my jobs, or am I identified with my God self? And you can situate any human being at any stage of the life using those three axes. If there were a butterfly in the middle of that room, by measuring out how far along the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis, you can pinpoint exactly where, where the, the butterfly is. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that the kind of really, truly evil people are stuck in the corner on the floor. They have no compassion. There's no freedom. They're addicted to power. And their, their self-image is basically their identity of their ego. Mm -hmm. And Jesus figure or a Buddha figure or a Krishna would be in the corner right up behind you, totally full of compassion, completely free, and have identified with their God consciousness. And, you know, whether you call that top corner the abode of Krishna or, or, or Jesus or Mary Magdalene or Mother Teresa, I don't give a damn. As long as they're mm -hmm. up in that corner, you know, <laughs> that's where I want to be headed as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Philip, in, in Druidry, is there anything like this this call to compassion, to, to freedom, to to um to be a better person? Is there a sense of of a, a, a moving upwards to to a higher consciousness? Yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think I think the um the the you know there's this central concept in Druidry is Arwen, if you like. Uh, which, which in, in in many ways, I think you can equate with the concept of grace in in the Christian tradition. But it's this 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 idea that if you're able to disidentify, to be free of of your baggage, as it were, uh, that the the the, the you know, inspiration can flow through you, and it's also the love of the gods, and and that love and inspiration can 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 flow, and with it comes creativity and giving. Mm -hmm. So this concept of sort of giving. Uh, is 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 really powerful, and of course, you know that that lovely tradition of hospitality that you find in in Ireland, for instance, and uh, you know that warmth that's coming, I believe, from that kind of place, you know. But but thank you, Sean, so much for that for what you've said about because, of course, you know, in in simply saying that, you remove a stumbling block. It's as if it's as if there's this stumbling block that that is you know 
you know, in my experience of attending services at uh, at this beautiful Orthodox church in the forest and in Britain, it's such an overwhelming sense of 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 of, of love and light and 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 um, imminent divinity, I suppose you would say. And these guys are druids. You see, the, the extraordinary thing is these priests. Uh, they see themselves as druids as well, as well as Christians. Um, and I'm experiencing all this. And then at some point, and I I, 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 I totally allow myself to abandon my th thoughts, as it were, and just to be in the moment. And you know, but at some point, I'll, I, I would find myself saying, "But hang on a minute, you're not you're not actually a Christian, are you? Because you have you sort of haven't accepted Christ as your savior. And and you know, you have the you know these ideas come, you know." Um, but I find the mass, the the taking in of the you know the, uh, of the body and blood of Christ, extraordinarily powerful. The way they do it, they see it as a magical ceremony, and they when they when they do the Eucharist, they do it, and it's beautifully done, and it feels like the most profound ceremony, and it's to do with union with the divine because you're taking in i mean it's it's just bec it becomes an extraordinary experience absolutely you're absolutely right philip absolutely. so for instance um for me the whole objective of ritual of any kind is to create an altered state of consciousness <clears throat> in which people individuals in the community can have gnostic experiences of the mystery it's not to mm. create it's not to lead into dogmatic utterances or creedal formulations and so for mm. me as a priest of 50 years at this stage i never celebrate Eucharist without having some kind of a transcendent experience. Because for me, it is like that the elements are, you know, just creating a ritual which takes me out of my physical, they're transpersonal, transpatial, transtemporal, and transrational. And so that I can engage, you know, uh, my intuitive faculty or my inner divinity. Uh, and at that stage, I'm meeting with Jesus of Nazareth, or I'm meeting with the Buddha. There's no time anymore. Yeah, I'm at a different level, a different dimension where I'm experiencing a transrational, a transrational, and a transtemporal reality. So for me, that that's the beauty of the druidic ceremonies, that they're not for their own sake. They're there to create the altered state of consciousness, which brings you into a different dimension. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm hearing here is that there are so many layers to Sean's particular form of Christianity and Philip Druidry like they're so they seem so similar it's about connecting with the divine whether that's through nature whether that's through a human being that became God or was a God man um it's it's sort of there seems to be so many parallels here so I guess my next question is can you be a Druid and a Christian do we think that it's these are paths that can 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 be explored parallel can they can they complement each other um is there is there anything stopping people from and i'm asking from my <laughs> my own point of view is is this actually like a gateway to to a, a more beautiful compassionate accepting view of the world and people and nature like this integration of these two spiritualities sean perhaps you'd like to start and then, i'm going to start with just one statement you asked is it possible to be a druid uh, and a Christian at the same time. Yes, I don't think it, I don't think it's possible to be a Christian unless unless you become a druid. Yes, I don't think it's possible <laughs> to be a druid unless, unless you become a Christian. Love because it. You haven't understood druidry if you haven't understood the kind of the Christ consciousness or the Buddha nature at the core of it, and you haven't understood Christianity unless you realize the druidical nature of seeing God everywhere. Ah. So you can't be a Christian without being a druid, or you can't be a druid without being a Christian. It's a truth bomb. <laughs> but that's beautiful sean philip what what do you think well i would i would i would just i would just say that you know as i wrote in that in in the in the book that you cited you know the seek seek teachings everywhere um that certainly it's a way i wouldn't be quite so categorical as sean i'd say i'd say <laughs> uh i'd say um that certainly if you feel drawn to following those two paths and feeling yourself to be on a druid Christian path or a Christian druid path, as many people do. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, when people say, oh, druidry is pagan, I always have to say, well, many druids are, see themselves as pagan, but, but actually there, there are plenty of Christian druids or druid Christians as well, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's, it's, it's certainly a very fertile combination, I think, very worth, worthwhile exploring. 
Interesting. So, and I would say as well that when I say you can't be a Christian up in a Druid or a Druid up in a Christian, I don't, I don't mean that you have to practice both systems simultaneously. I mean that when you drill to the core of either system, you're going to find the commonality, the kind of the water, the water table from which they both spring. If you choose yeah. to kind of engage with the ritual of, of of both at the same time, that's great. But it, it ne- it's not necessary. What you're going to find, right. if I drilled my well down further, if I don't be about 260 feet, I'd finally get down to a level of the water where there is no geological toxicity introduced mm-hmm. by the systems to which it's emerged. And so in that sense, you know, Druidry and Christianity are at that level. Mm-hmm. And if you go down deep enough, you're finding what they have in common. Mm-hmm. If you choose yeah. to then engage yeah. with the rituals of both at the same time, that's uh, icing on the cake. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> so uh, just quickly, how, how can we move towards healing? So so how do we move towards healing? Well, I, 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 I think is the, the attitude of, you know, uh, as Sean has, has, has said, the, the attitude of compassion, I think, is, is central, of, of love and compassion. And then... That's, if you like, for me, that's at the heart level. That's a sort of basic orientation, mm. love, a, a sense of love being at the heart of the mystery and of the universe and of meaning and so on. And then at the level of the mind, a kind of op- a curiosity, a really inquiring mind, mm. I think. So, you know, so to, to, to take, to look at things from different perspectives, uh, that, that to me seems the way of healing. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, which is why for me, you know, the, the meeting place of psychology and, and spirituality is so interesting because psychology has a particular kind of way of looking at things, which I think is very valuable. But on its own, I need more. You know, it, it's it's limited to me, you know, and then the, the, the spiritual ideas have a huge value. When, when I when I those are my two sort of favorite lenses, as it were, I put the two together. And 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 and, and so the coming healing is bringing together, I think, is mm-hmm. It's an important process. I think that's beautiful. beautiful. John, would you like to add anything just before we yeah, wind one up? Final statement. In some senses, those three axes of which I spoke, compassion, freedom, and self-awareness. The truth is, if you if you if you um max max out on any one of those, you have ipso facto uh, max out on the other two as well. If you really understand who you are, there's no place except compassion and freedom. Mm. If you're truly free, there's no place except compassion and self-identity. And if you max out in compassion, there's no place except freedom and self-identity. So in, I agree with Philip. If you max out in any one of these, you have all three already. That's beautiful. Oh, thank Lovely. you so much for your time, gentlemen. This has been a fabulous conversation. I feel like we could go on for hours. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for taking time out of your days and for sharing your wisdom and your insights. And I feel, yeah, I feel nourished from this conversation. And I hope perhaps in the future we can we can continue on this path and see see what other nuggets we can <laughs> we can dig out of this beautiful fertile ground, as you said, Philip. So thank you Please, to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And we you have to give a hug to Imer. Imer from I will. I will. I will. Okay. Love and blessings to okay. you both. Love and blessings. Love Thank you so much. And, and, and let's be in touch again soon. For sure. Bye. Bye.